Good morning. So good to see everybody this morning. We have a beautiful sunny day, and we are very, very glad you're here, uh, that you've come to worship with us. Uh, welcome to those who are uh, worshiping with us remotely, and um, just God is good. All the time? That is good. Would you please join me now in the call to worship by standing? The words will be on the screen. Beckoning God as you moved in the life of Elijah. Help us to listen for your voice and to speak your prophetic word. Empowered by your spirit. Will you please remain standing to join in the opening hymn, Over a Thousand Songs to Sing, uh, found on page 57 in the hymnal and on the screen. <laughs> seated. We're going to come now to our time of prayer, and I always want to remind you that we do have uh, inserted in your bulletins our prayer journal that lists uh, uh, concerns that we have of many of our church family and many of our family and friends. So um, see if you can keep this near you at some time during the week so that you can lift these people up as you have your daily prayers. And now I would like for us to um, go together and to uh, pray to our living God. O oh, oh, most loving and gracious God, we gather together this morning to worship you in song and in words and in prayer with all of our hearts and minds, with our souls and our strength. For you, Father God, so loved our world that you sent his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We have hope in that promise, for we live in a world that is like a stormy sea at times, rocking us back and forth in our faith, trying to find our way, wanting to be more like Jesus. Sometimes we get overwhelmed, Lord, and we feel like you've left us, but we must remember that you are always there. You promised us that, when we feel like you've left us, it's only we who have wandered off the path. It is us, we have drifted away from you. 
When we are sad or feeling depressed, you surround us with your peace. When we cry, Lord, when we cry tears, you are there to wipe the tears away with compassion. When we are happy, when things are going great, you rejoice with us. When we are lost, you call to us. When we are sick and hurting, you reach out your healing touch. We lift those people who need your healing touch today. Please with all, be with all those dear souls on our prayer list and with those who are in our hearts. Help us be your hands and feet, reaching out to those in need. Help us to be your eyes and ears to the opportunities every day to further your kingdom here in Baltimore and in the world. We ask a special blessing this morning upon our youth and adults as they travel to the Jackson area to do good works. May this experience be fruitful for them and for those they serve. We thank you, Father, for your unconditional love. May we feel your love and your presence as we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we'd ask that you would stand and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. children to come up and join JR for children's moments. We'll see if I work. There I am. <laughs> Still low battery, so I don't know. We'll see if I see if I last. Good morning. I guess if I don't last, God give me the screaming holler I can yell loud enough to <laughs> through it. How are y'all doing today? Good. Enjoying the beautiful weather before we get hotter and hotter next week? So I might help Pastor, Pastor Ben this morning with, uh, he's going to be preaching 1 Kings 19 through 15. But he's going to talk about hydration and stuff. Do you know what, what can we take with us or what do we drink or whatever to get us hydrated or help build our body back to what we need, energy. Water. Boom. How's that? What else do we drink? Boom. Nah, I can't drink that stuff. That's red stuff. And then the grandpa stuff back here, he drinks. Is that called, you got a quencher? Squincher, squincher, winter, loser. <laughs> so, yeah, we drink those to get a hydrate, hydration back together, right? So, 
God asked Elijah, Elijah was afraid. He ran for a life when he came to Bershida in Judah. He left his servants there while he, he himself went a day journey onto the wilderness. He, he came to the broom brush. Said that sat down under under and, and prayed and that he might die. I have enough, Lord. He said, Take my life. I am I am no better than an ancestors. Then he lay down under the, the bush and fell asleep. What do you think? Should we give up? Nah. So where where do you go to find to get your replenishment? In ideas. So, I think we can go to the Bible and stuff. So, maybe, maybe Elijah should should have should have some of you with him. Maybe depending on the answers. When he went on his journey and to Herbert, Elijah was a prophet, and he had called to gave God the word to his people at a time when they had turned their back on God. And he, he wasn't always very popular. And one day he found himself having to leave quite quickly. He walked for day days or sitting down under the tree and giving up. He wasn't a very mood in telling God that he had enough. He didn't, didn't walk any further. And after he ran, ran to at God, he fell asleep, but wasn't going to, to leave like that. God sent an angel to him. Get up, get up and eat and bring some nice fresh bread and jug of water. So he got up and ate and drank, and then back to sleep. So God sent a second angel and with more food and water. Get up and eat. So he got up and second time and drank, ate and drank. Elijah found he was strong enough to carry as on his journey, thanks to the providing God. And with everything that need to keep him strong for his long journeys. So do you think that that would help us if we drink our water, that we get energy? Yes, sir. See, see Pastor Ben drinks water while he preaches, so he gives him his energy. <laughs> But his is, his is probably the fountain water. What do you think? Fountain water. Think we can do that? Let's say a little prayer. Bow your head. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our provider in energy and hydration to give us. We ask you to just give us this day as we walk through you and follow your path and be able to spread your word in your name. We pray. Amen. Thank you, children, and thank you, JR. We come now to a, a time of doing a responsive reading. That is the uh, Psalm 42. It's found in your hymnals on 777, but it will also be on the screen. As the deer longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for you, O God. My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? O oh, Lord God, who may never shall praise my help and my God. 
My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Miser. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, God's song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Like a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Oh, Amen. I'd ask now uh, Rob Sayer if he would come up and give us a report on the West Ohio Annual Conference. Good morning. It uh, was my privilege once again to serve as your lay delegate to the West Ohio Annual Conference again this year. And uh, I was given five minutes for this report. Oh, go ahead. But uh, since we're ahead of schedule with already having the prayer and the uh, Lord's Prayer, uh, that takes a little bit of the pressure off. <laughs> uh, the 53rd session of the West Ohio Annual Conference was a virtual gathering of nearly 1,600 clergy and lay members held June 3rd and 4th. Bishop Gregory V. Palmer presided over the conference under the theme, Becoming. This theme was rooted in the scripture, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. The theme focused on becoming more like Jesus, becoming community, and becoming spirit-filled. Palmer challenged the conference to examine who they choose to be as followers of Jesus Christ in these difficult times in the church and in the world. Who are we in that pivot and turning moment where we must answer the question, who do we choose to be, said Palmer. The bishop invited attendees to take opportunity, quote, to be in conversation in Christian community and discover again that God is the heart of our lives, unquote. I'm not going to go into a great bit of detail about uh, all the business sessions, a couple of things that I did want to bring up. Uh, the budget for the coming year for the conference was passed. The total amount to be apportioned is $17.7 .7 million, and that's right in line with what it was for 2022, so there's not a big increase there. That is good news for us as a uh, local church. Um, the number of districts in the West Ohio Conference shall become six districts beginning July 1st, 2023. The bishop and cabinet will lead the process to set and announce district boundaries no later than March 1st, 2023. This could have some impact uh, depending upon whether we end up moving from a district that we're in to another district or uh, they may rename all the districts. Who knows by the time uh, that happens. And uh, a couple of other items. Uh, sadly, the annual conference voted on the closing of eight churches since annual conference last year. One of those was Mor Mills Memorial United Methodist Church in Lancaster. And uh, the uh, special offering for the annual conference this year uh, goes for humanitarian efforts in Ukraine and uh, with the money that you have given and other West Ohioans have contributed so far, a total of uh, nearly $250,000 has been raised for those humanitarian efforts. Things that will be coming up, um, they did not hold a laity session as part of annual conference this year. There will be a separate laity session in August, and as soon as information is available, we'll pass that along to you. Uh, there will be a Jewish 
jurisdictional conference in November, and that will be uh, a regional conference uh, that will come together to elect and uh, assign bishops to the various annual conferences. Uh, Bishop Palmer, who has only two years until retirement, is hopeful that he'll get to stay with West Ohio for those final two years. Our annual conference affirmed the recommendation of the general and jurisdictional conference delegations in support of Reverend Dr. Todd Anderson as an Episcopal candidate. Dr. Anderson is just finishing tenure as one of the district superintendents in our conference. And then finally, general conference will not meet until 2024. It will be at that time that they would take up the issues of where the church is going and what the future of the United Methodist Church will look like. And then finally, the 2023 West Ohio Annual Conference Planning Committee is planning for an in-person annual conference next year. And tentatively, that will be held June 1st through 4th at Otterbein University in Westerville. And uh, I will be providing additional information that you can go online and look at more detail concerning the things that happened at annual conference. If any of you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me with those questions and be glad to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And, uh, the endeavor was to, uh, to work the, the work of worship all together and uh, in the time that we have together on this Sunday morning. I appreciate that. I, I, uh, I had particular parts of the sessions that I was able to attend and really caught the flavor of the, the overview of all that. And I appreciate that. Thanks so much. And, uh, it is, uh, I do not wish to be coy in saying that it's a difficult time to be the church. Amen? and to be a United Methodist Church, and to be a church in a small community, and all those things. And yet it is for the time a challenge of which we were called to Christ, because it is for this time which we were called to faith. And so we, uh, we are uh, in that, uh, that journey together. Uh, uh, I appreciate that Cheryl was, uh, was uh, light on her feet, and. Uh, and uh, as she responded and led worship in the opening this morning, I changed more things internally than you can imagine. And, uh, and yet I so endeavored to not do that, uh, I just fiddled. And, uh, and so it is that I gave her an opening prayer in a place that uh, she did expect the prayers of the people or, or out of order and all of that. So as uh, as we heard that the deer as the deer panteth for the water so my soul longs for god we come into that that sense of longing today and uh, that that uh, the sense of what it is to be to be seeking and searching and uh, and desiring god's nourishment and to wonder in the midst of that song as in the midst of our our scripture today uh, as to what in the world does it mean that uh, that we uh, we call out to God in, in such difficult circumstances. If I'm on track, I'm just to read the scripture and then we have a hymn of preparation. Yes. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> well, First Kings, as Monty uh, gave us the introduction with the children uh, and, and just that, uh, that we focused on what is it to be refreshed or to restore, be restored and uh, physically and emotionally and spiritually ultimately and uh, and, uh, and so the scripture comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, and it really is the second half of a, of a two-parter here in, in chapter 18 also, where uh, Elisha, Elijah, I, I now have a grandson named Elisha, and I have to be careful of my enunciations. Elijah was facing the, the, the prophets of Baal, B-A-A-L, and a pagan worship that had begun to settle into the, into the land of Israel. And in that worship, it was that the king's wife, King Ahab, and his wife Jezebel, uh, she was very instrumental because she brought in her marriage, uh, being the daughter of a foreign king, brought that worship with her. And so it is then in chapter 19 that we read 
the reaction after, uh, in a sense, Elijah faces off with the prophets of Baal, and there is a lot of, uh, of bloodletting, and, uh, and we cannot, uh, we would not go there. We cannot discuss all of that, but we turn to this, is that Elijah becomes fretful and fearful and anxious and runs away. Ahab reported to Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, including the massacre of the prophets. Jezebel immediately sent a message to Elijah with her threat, the gods will get you for this and I will even get even with you. By this time tomorrow you'll be dead as any one of these prophets. When Elijah saw how things were, he ran for dear life to Beersheba, far into the south of Judea, Judah, and he left his young servant there and went on into the desert another day's journey. And he came to a lone broom bush, collapsed in the shade, wanting in the worst way to be done with it all, to just die. Enough of this, God. Take my life. I'm ready to join my ancestors in the grave. Exhausted, he fell asleep under the lone broom bush. Suddenly an angel shook him awake and said, get up and eat. He looked around and to his surprise, that's the picture, and to his surprise right by the head were a loaf of bread baked on some coals and a jug of water and he ate the meal and went back to sleep. The angel of God came back and shook him awake again and said, get up, get up, eat some more. You've got a long journey ahead of you. And he got up, ate and drank his fill and set out. Nourished by that meal, he walked 40 days and 40 nights all the way to the mountain of God, to Mount Horeb. And when he got there, he crawled into a cave and went to sleep. And then the word of God came to him. So Elijah, what are you doing here? I've, got working, I've been working my heart out for the God of the angel army, said Elijah. This is the message of translation. I've been working my heart out for the God of the angel army, said Elijah. The people of Israel abandoned your covenant, destroyed the places of worship, murdered your prophets, and I am the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And then he was told, go stand on the mountain at attention before God, and God will pass by. A hurricane wind ripped through the mountains and shattered the rocks before God, but God wasn't to be found in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle and quiet whisper. And Elijah heard the quiet voice. He muffled his face with a great cloak and went to the mouth of the cave and stood there, and a quiet voice asked, So, Elijah, tell me, why are you here? And Elijah said again, I've been working my heart out for God, the, the God of the angel armies, because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed your places of worship, murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And God said, go back the way you came through the desert to Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Hazael and make him king over Aram. May God bless the reading, the hearing of the sacred text today. Amen? Amen. 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 And now let us join in our hymn of preparation near to the heart of God found on 472. And the words will be on the screen.
Thank you. Yes. As we look to, uh, to gather the text today, I, I chose a, a title, and uh, there, is, there is both inspiration and consternation about titles to sermons. Uh, listening to the silent God. Well, wait a minute, I thought God says things, reveals things, God does. So I could have said, listening for God in silence, or listening until we are silent to be able to hear God. But sometimes God just waits until we're willing to listen. It was April uh, 20, uh, 2015, uh, what, seven years ago, that, uh, that I was in a, a room in, uh, in Worthington at the conference office, and there was a raid in the room, uh, 15 other adults. Uh, I was the one on the other end of this conversation. Uh, mostly clergy, but some laity, and the conversation was, well, do you think that you'll let me back into pastor to lead a church? Because I'd stepped out for a year. And to say it in that way is to, is to be quite gracious about the opportunity and the necessity that we try to stay connected with clergy and that, that a pastor in the United Methodist Church just doesn't serve a church, as you know, at their own will, but they do not come and go at their own discretion. The year before, I had sat with this in a similar way with a, a similar group and had said, I need to step out. I need time. I need a time out. I need a break. And to describe that is to describe that in such a way that I can never only hint at the possibilities of, of all the things that were happening in, in life for Cheryl and I of, of uh, changing circumstances for her call and her ministry at First United Methodist Church in Lancaster of being an appointment that, uh, that perhaps was the most challenging appointment that I'd ever served in in all of my ministry. That it, to be in a place where uh, I was tapped out, Cheryl was driving 70 miles round trip to uh, Lancaster for even the, the hospital visits and, and uh, funerals and all of the regular care, of pastoral care, much less the regular uh, office and the worship of, uh, of a local church with six, seven hundred people in worship on Sunday morning. She was on staff, but uh, we came to that place. The church that I'd been at uh, even needed a, a consult to come in to do conflict mediation, and, and for the moment it wasn't uh, that I was on that side of that, but the congregation needed that because it needed to, among itself, tell its story. And so in the reality of all of that, it was that I began a year of being out of ministry. We just bought the house in Lancaster and, and to put all these crises and big events and big life events all together, my mother died in March. We bought a house in April. Uh, we moved to that house and I left the church. Now, Cheryl is the most kind and considerate person you could ever imagine. And I can just imagine how my summer of riding my bicycle around Lancaster appeared. <laughs> It was, like a, it was like summer vacation. But as I faced the reality of a, of a vocational crisis and an emotional uh, roller coaster that was mostly on the downhill side of that, and that's why I tell this, because it's, uh, this is where I touched Elijah, or Elijah touched me. That by the time it became Christmas, I felt almost disoriented, not because I think that I was uh, missing doing a Christmas Eve worship service or all the seasonal worship as I went to worship at uh, both a church that our children worshiped and, and came to First United Methodist Church on Christmas Eve. But by the time I got to the middle of January and all of the, the dark, long dark nights and all the realities of, of living my life now with not outside and mowing the yard and attending to those things, but the emotional energy and the reality of being so anxious that all I could do is watch HGTV and try to figure out how to rehab my house. <laughs> and I say that not to make light of the reality, but to bring humor to, I think, what most of us can experience or have experienced. We just feel tapped out. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, our energies are gone. And it was the beginning of that year that then I began to volunteer 
volunteered at hospice in Fairhope Hospice. Began to volunteer as a chaplain at the hospital to where it seemed like a, a God opportunity that then I can start serving as an on-call chaplain there. And so in April of 2015, I sat down with this group of folks and I thought it should be my, my, uh, my, my next uh, research paper and spiritual burnout, not just clergy, but burnout, emotional burnout, and the story of Elijah. The story of Elijah is unfolded, and we've told it here now a couple of wonderful ways, but with the children and, uh, and through the reading of the scripture, that Elijah was the, was the is, is yet and was then the image of the, of the greatest of the prophets, not because of what he wrote like Isaiah and Jeremiah, but because of his life was such the example that it was the image of, this, of the hero of faith in a time that was dark and difficult. When, uh, when Jesus asked you know, the, the crowd that included his disciples, who do people think that I am? Who do they say that I am? The first they said, you're Elijah. You've come back. And when, when Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration and he speaks with these that were with him, the two on the mountain in the cloud amongst Peter, James, and John, it is Elijah and Moses, the great prophet, the great lawgiver. And Elijah is reported to not have died because at the time that he was uh, mentoring Elisha, his protege in uh, prophecy, they were, he was caught up in a whirl of wind as the clouds gathered and a flaming chariot descended. And, and when it was all over, he was gone. Yeah, Jesus, we think you are Elijah. And I want to say just for a moment, this is not where I identified with, uh, with Elijah. I identified with Elijah starting in chapter 19. He was threatened. I'm not, I wasn't threatened. I was, threat, I was threatened of my own self-understanding of anything. He was threatened and afraid and, and anxious and and as if the biggest moment of his ministry in chapter 18 came crashing down around him with the, with the reality of the challenge of, of Jezebel's words to most particularly come after him. And Elijah finally looked around and said, it appears that I'm all by myself and I'm all alone in this situation. And so it was that he, he broke, he snapped. And all of our, our best conversations and care about, about mental health, this is a part of that reality of spiritual vitality, of, of community and connection and vitality. And all of this understands that we are all, uh, even at our best, we are, we are love expressed in a broken humanity. Amen? It's true. And he runs, and he runs, and you get this chapters of running. He runs straight into the southern uh, desert south of Judah. He runs, and he runs, and he leaves his servant, and he goes for another day, and he falls. There's one bush, and he falls into the shadow of one bush, pictured in the, the starting of the, the call wake up. A ministering messenger, a, 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 an angel of God, a, a kind one from, uh, from God comes his way and ministers to him, begins to feed him. You could go through the need for rest sometimes we need, because uh, 2 a.m. with HGTV is not a great thing for the regular patterns of life and, uh, and reality. We could think about the need for nourishment and, and, and the, the things that feed us physically and, and the things that bring us into balance here in that situation in reality also as Elijah is attended to. And he calls out to God, I'd just rather die right here, right now, and be buried with my ancestors than go any further. You know, the, the, the situation is that, uh, that if you take care of me, God, then my enemies won't get me. And David uh, pictures that in the psalm that we read this morning also. Well, every, they're saying, where is your God? 
They, put me, they, they try to put me to shame, God. Where are you, man? Where are you? So he sent off after this rest and refreshment and nourishment for 40 days. Now, this is another 40, 40, 40, 40 in the scriptures. He goes back. Mount Horeb is the other named part of a mountain where Mount Sinai is. Mount Horeb is the other named part of Mount Sinai where and Moses received the Ten Commandments. And, and you might say, albeit that Moses received the Ten Commandments and there were swirling clouds and crashing rocks and lightning and fire and smoke and burning bushes, speaking God in, in the midst of some phenomenal kind of, of uh, unnatural circumstances, supernatural circumstances. You could say that here on Mount Horeb, which is described in the scripture as the mountain of God, also all together, and, and, and Elijah is there, and he hears what now needs to be heard afterwards. Not in the earthquake, not in the, in the storm, not from lightning and, and smoke and and fire, but what he hears in the whisper. If it's, if, it's, if it's an endemic today, a pandemic that's become endemic is that we live noisy lives. Elisha, Elisha lived a noisy life too, so let's not say it's, a, it's a, a, just a 2022 20, kind of thing. We have different means to put noise into our heads. But for Elijah, it was his own self-talk. He didn't need a, <laughs> a post or a blog or a commentator. He was his own. And he shamed himself, and he was worried, and he was afraid. And all he could say was, I want to die. It's, it, this still small voice, we still know that I'm God voice, is, is the voice that came to Elijah in such a way that it really is hard to translate it. It is not just that it was that he heard a God speaking softly, but it was that he's heard whatever he heard in here. And he had to quiet himself here and to be silent with God enough. The Jerusalem Bible, which, yeah, it's only, only the, call me a nerd. I had a Jerusalem Bible in high school and I, and I pretty well worn out the, the binding and somebody gave me a fresh one sometime recently as a gift and how wonderful that was. But the Jerusalem Bible says verse 12 like this. And after the fire came the sound of a gentle breeze. We know how restorative it can be if we just got out on the patio sometimes. We agree? Or take a walk in the woods. Or get to where all we hear are the birds in the babbling brook. And feel the gentle breeze that in hearing nothing audibly, and hearing nothing in the moment here except quiet reflection here, we find ourselves wrapped up in the presence of God. Amen? But here, uh, there's been a, the, the revised standard, the new revised standard uh, version has been, has tweaked this word one more notch. And it is because it is here that there is a deep reservoir in being silent with God. Here's that verse. And after the fire, a sound of pure silence. That's when we're no longer listening to ourselves, our self talk, our self doubts, even our self promotions. It is here, there, then, where we simply are in the presence of the one who loves us so immensely that all of our defenses have to be let go because we are no longer defending ourselves before God or anyone else, but we simply are. And it is the most lovely place and a place where we are then are so empty that we can perhaps start to be filled and restored. 
Now for, for Elijah, it came at the end of a, of a long seeking, searching journey, 40 days into the desert on the other side of the mountain where the great commandments were given with flashes of fire and thunder and lightning and all of that. And yet it is here that he hears a gentle breeze and silence and know that he is in God's presence because when we settle down enough I want you to to know that it's discerned in the heart in the spirit the heart is a corollary to that but it is discerned in the inner spirit where where God has been poured where you've welcomed God that you have Mother Teresa, who is known for caring for the poor and the dying of the streets of Calcutta, uh, practiced silence quite a bit. And that's kind of interesting. She, not that she, her spiritual journey a decade later revealed yeah, she dealt with depression also. Perhaps that's part of the interior life sometimes. But here's what she says about coming to the place of regular silence in the presence of God. Cheryl found this for me, and I thank her for this. In the silence of the heart, God speaks. If you face God in prayer and silence, God will speak to you. Then you will know that you are nothing. It is only then, it is only when you realize your nothingness, your emptiness, that God can fill you with himself. This is the conclusion. Souls of prayer are souls of great silence. It's only one of the, of the great uh, orchestration of prayer. But it is so essential. And I encourage you to explore it as you move forward as a congregation. I, I, I encourage you to, to be, because not only when we are less thinking and less telling ourselves what we think we know or understand that we can listen to God and to each other. Paul, Paul wrote to the church in Rome in chapter 5, verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame. It's not, it's not meant for our shame. But maybe our humility. Hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Okay, love came down to Pentecost. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which who God has given to us. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Well, I hadn't preached for a couple of years, uh, three years, um, since I did really retire. <laughs> and I thank God for the opportunities to uh, be here for these three Sundays and to be back next week. I share this with you not that you might better understand me, but you might better understand yourself and the ways of God and each other. And we'll go there next week. Let us pray. Oh God, in this day we pray for, uh, for all things to work together for your good, for those that love you and are called according to your purpose. And so you are able to wrap up our greatest fears and our, and our greatest hopes all together, and that we would not be put to shame for what we hope and desire, but that we might be layered again with love and grace and faith and hope and compassion and kindness and gentleness towards ourselves and with each other. Bless the Lord this day as we come for these moments of worship. Uh, for our conclusion together today, all for your glory we say, amen. 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 There is, and Cheryl will uh, enforce that in just a moment to uh, invitation to prayer. It begins today for the church and for the future of uh, the ministry of Christ I Methodist and the clergy family who comes into your midst. Well, now we're gonna, we're gonna pray for uh, a prayer, send off a couple of blessing prayers for our work campers.
and Scott and Amy and any other uh, youth and adults who would participate in that, come on down and you will be participant observers. If you would incline your hearts towards, uh, towards prayer for these this morning and for the week ahead. We get weary and uh, these folk are gonna go make themselves a tard for, uh, for a good endeavor and a, and a, and a great cause of, uh, of uh, the Jackson Area Ministries and uh, blessings on you and those who join you. And uh, I think, I don't know who all might just lift up that prayer, but uh, Scott and I invite you to pray with me in these moments of uh, a blessing. Oh God, for, uh, for the wonderful ways in which you call us, uh, that, that you send us, and on the ways you prepare us, uh, and that you grow us. Uh, bless these and their willing hearts and their willing hands for the week to come. And Lord, we ask you to keep our friends at uh, Summit Station that will be joining us this afternoon and, and this coming week. Keep them in safe and safe travels. And we ask for your blessings on the families we'll be serving. Uh, keep everybody safe. And just allow uh, allow us to be your hands and feet and uh, serve those folks in Jackson County and the families that will be uh, helping out. Pray for your blessings on them. Mm. And also ask that you keep uh, uh, heal Wade and Rita as they're recovering from COVID. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to make it down later this week. Lord, for uh, safe travels and safe work, for renewed and refreshed spirits uh, encased in weary bodies, uh, protect and keep all of these and theirs in this week to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's give them. Uh, there will be some send-off later today, but let us encourage them with uh, our acclaim. Thank you, for that. thank you, thank you. It's a wonderful thing, this work camp that has, um, we have sent uh, off to Southeastern Ohio now and we've been joining Summit Station uh, and that has just formed wonderful friendships between uh, the youth and the adults of those two churches. So uh, again, we do invite you to uh, come today at two o'clock, if I've got that right, two o'clock for an ice cream social. Is that still on? Yes? Always. Always. Okay, that's still on. Uh -huh. And they're going to be loading and packing up those trucks and cars and heading down there, trying to leave around 2.30. And I think we've got, we can stick around a little longer, Tim. Is that true? Absolutely. We can stick around a little longer for, for, to enjoy some ice cream. So come back if you're able to do that. Uh, so as you are able now, if you will stand and join in our closing hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, found on 577. <laughs>
good voice this morning. Um, I failed to recognize Cheryl earlier, so um, Ben's better half. Cheryl Fogg is here with us today. Well, we're so happy to have you. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to um, agree her, please do that following the service. Uh, we also uh, have uh, an announcement that Louise Smith has asked me to read. The Rebecca Circle thanks everyone who donated items to the yard sale, those who helped sort and price, the people who worked during the sale, and especially the volunteers who helped box and bag unsold items clean the gym, and reset the room Saturday afternoon. It was a great success. Uh, again, thanks to everyone who was involved. And thanks especially for those people who chair that, that uh, particular event that we have annually. Um, just a couple of other quick announcements that we have. We are having a 12-hour prayer vigil today. Uh, and there is a sign-up sheet. It's 15-minute increments of just leaving that busy time that you have and taking that time of silence and praying for, uh, for all that we need to pray for. We're praying for uh, Pastor Steve and Tricia as they go to a new appointment. We're, we're praying for Pastor Mike and for Bonnie who will be coming here in a couple of weeks. We pray for our church. We pray for our conference and we pray for the world. So. Uh, there are definitely more than 40 people here, and we have 40 open spots. So we would love for you to, as you leave, to stop by the table out there and please sign up and take 15 minutes today to be able to lift those prayers to God. And we also uh, will have next Saturday evening, again, it's the third Saturday every uh, month, to have our free community uh, meal that we offer. and. Hopefully the weather will be good and we will be out on the North Lawn uh, under, uh, under the trees and we will have basically a cookout. So invite your friends, invite your neighbors, and please come yourselves and share uh, in that meal. It's, it's a really good thing. And now um, I'll turn it over for our benediction from Pastor Ben. I do want to say, and I, I regret that, uh, that my uh, wandering missed a major point and, and this is my care for you this morning and that is that Elijah had a ministering angel he had someone who came to him and I want you to know that that in my life through the course of ministry I consulted a friend who was a pastoral counselor I had short sessions with two different psychologists. I had a spiritual director and, a, and a, a life coach at different times. All these things, including doctors and counselors and good medication for the situations of our lives are all a part of God's ministering to us. And if you can find that right combination, you know that, amen? amen. We are not I don't want you to think that you were just left alone, uh, sitting by yourself somewhere trying to figure it out in silence. But that was a part of that journey that brought Elijah to the place where he could come back where the nation of Israel literally retouched God through his renewal. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance and give you his peace, now and forever. Amen.